Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, here with you again, Rina, me, <laughs> that's me, and my um, other half, half um, Ildiko, uh, together again, finally, both of us in Europe, and uh, presenting this podcast to you. And today we are very, very pleased to have Marlita with us. And we will be talking about online course, course creation. And I know you might be wondering, I mean, we had quite a few guests lately uh, around online creation because there are so many ways um, to skin the cat, so to say. And um, many of you might be um, this far already in your journey where you're actually considering um, running your online course and you just know where to start. So there are plenty, plenty of videos already available on the, our YouTube channel. We had so many incredible speakers and I've learned something new from each and every one. And so, um, yeah, and Marlita is going to present to us her um, kind of like starter kit. Um, and hopefully this will help you kind of like get you started on, on thinking and preparing your online course. Um, there is so much value in doing it and automating your um, financial streams. And so over to you, Marlita, why don't you share with us a bit more about yourself? What is it that you do? How did you even get started with, with this whole niche? And uh, yeah, and what, what are your, your insights for us? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so yes, my name is Marlita Hill, and I have had a very eclectic journey. Um, I am a writer, a podcaster, a teacher, um, and I crossed the areas of faith, art, and entrepreneurship. And my journey had started with me trying to build a career as an artist, um, and make money so that I could do my art. Um, and then that expanded into, oh my gosh, I have to learn how to make money at this. Oh, then I need to learn business. Oh, entrepreneurship is the best way for me. Oh, I write books too. So um, my journey has been very eclectic. And so I come to you now, 20 years, 20 plus years having done this. I've written multiple books. I've been an educator for over 20 years. So bringing all of that experience and knowledge together Something that I have discovered <laughs> the very hard way is that all of the things that we have to do to build our business, to structure it, um, to get the information out, to deliver it, it all is based on us having to make decisions, um, make choices, answer questions. And if we don't have clarity about what it is that we're trying to build, making those decisions become impossible sometimes. Um, in the case of my logo one time, I, I was going to get a logo done and she goes, great, um, I'm just gonna send you some questions and then uh, just send it back and we'll get started. And when she sent me that three page questionnaire, I realized I didn't know how to answer any of those questions. <laughs> so I didn't end up getting the logo done, right? or whether it's delivering a course. So if we don't have clarity about what it is that we're building, like I said, it's hard to make those decisions. It's hard to make those choices. It's, it's hard to answer those questions that service providers need to be able to give us what it is that we need to run our business, right? So that's how I got started in my work was realizing how important this was for me to move forward as a business owner. So that's what I do. I help creators get clear about what they're building, whether that's a course, writing a book, you know, um, all kinds of things, um, building a business. So that in a nutshell is the work that I do. Um, and so do I just jump in now? Okay, well, so in that vein, what I wanna come to you today is to just kind of give you an umbrella of some of the things that you're going to have to consider, some of the decisions you're going to have to make, factors you're going to have to consider to build your course, right? Because as Rena said in her introduction, there are a bajillion ways for you to do this, but it depends on what you need in your business, where you are as a business owner in your life, in your business, um, and what your clients work best with, right? So we're going to break this up in kind of four big chunks. The first thing is the content, right? That's what it is that you're teaching. I'm actually going to go into that last, 
uh, but I'm going to go into some of these other things first. But the first thing is your content, what it is that you're teaching. The second thing that you have to make decisions about is how you're going to structure it, because there's lots of ways for you to structure that content. After you structure it, you have to consider how are you going to deliver it? How are you going to get it from you to your clients? And then the last thing is, you know, how are you going to promote it? So those are kind of the four big areas that I want to talk to you about today. And I'm going to stop in between those to, to answer any questions or stop for questions. So if you have some that are more um, particular, then just, just let me know. Okay, so the first thing is we're going to start with how are you going to structure your course? As you know, from all of your um, other great people who have come and spoken to you, there are so many ways for you to structure a course, whether it's going to be video or audio, whether it's going to be a hybrid, um, is it going to be self-directed or cohort-based? Are you going to nest it in a membership? Um, is it a self-directed course with a coaching component on the back end or the front end, right? Does it start with a book? Do you have deliverables? So all of those are possible ways to create courses. But I think the bigger thing to think about is <laughs> when you're deciding how you want to structure your course, there are some things that you have to consider, right? One of those is where are you right now? Um, I have a, a course called Nail That Niche. And I remember I was thinking about how in the world am I going to structure this? I had the content fine, but the difficult thing for me was working through how I wanted to structure it. So I decided, oh, okay, I could do um, a video. But where I am in my life right now, right? I've just moved back home from California, um, from Jackson to California. I'm staying with my mom and her husband because um, I'm a partial caregiver for her. And so the two of them play the television really loudly. So in order for me to record my content, I have to get up early in the morning. Do I want to get up and have to do my hair and put makeup on at four o'clock in the morning to be able to do a video course? And I know it sounds silly, but these are real practical concerns that you have to think of. Where are you in your life right now? Is that going to be the best way to structure it? Um, so I decided, oh, well, maybe it'll be better as an audio course, right? Um, I don't want to have to deal with having to look a certain way. Um, I don't want to have to deal with my background right now. It's just not a good time to do that. So I decided to do audio. I recorded all of the audio. And then I realized in the midst of it, mm, but a lot of my content is task-based. So what I decided, the best way for me to deliver this content to people, um, this course, is actually through a workbook. So I created a workbook for all of this, right? So these are things that you're going to have to think through. There are lots of possibilities for you to structure your course, but where are you in your life right now? Environmentally, situationally. Another thing is what kind of technology do you have available? Because if I was to do a video course, I'd also have to think of editing, did I have the money right now to edit? Do I know anybody who's an editor? Like these are things that you have to think through when you're thinking about how am I going to structure my course, right? So those are things that I want you to think about. Um, the next thing is how are you going to deliver the course? Um, there are ways that you can do it. So you have marketplaces that you can use. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. So there's, you know, Teachable, Skillshare, Udemy. Um, I know we're an international audience here, so there are probably other things as well. Um, or you can host it on your site, or you can use a different kind of software. So things to consider about that is, one, do I want to have to deal with technology? Right. If I if I self host it on my website, one, do I know enough about that technology to have to do that? Do, do I want to deal with that technology right now? If you don't want to, 
then hosting it on a marketplace like Skillshare or Udemy might be a better fit for you? Or do I have an audience built up right now? If I do, then it might be better for me to host it on my own because I have a way to get people informed that the course is on my website. If I don't, then maybe again, a marketplace where there already is a built-in audience might be a better fit for me, right? Um, so these are things that you want to think about when you're thinking about your, how are you going to deliver it? But how are you going to get it from where you are to your people, yeah? I wanna pause right there to just ask really quickly before I go into the next thing, are there any questions right there? Okay, we're good to go. Fabulous. Um, so then the next thing is how are you going to promote it, right? Um, and this is something that's really important because we have to get information out about our course. And there are lots of ways that we could promote it. Um, but again, the thing is, who, who do you have in your, um, in your audience? And uh, actually, I'm gonna come back to that one. I'm gonna come back to that one at the end. Let's go to your content because here's, here's where the bulk of it is. None of this becomes possible if you don't know your content. So let's dive into that. Um, so first of all, you have choosing a topic, okay? And there are all kinds of ways. And one of the things that's really interesting to think about is what, what role is this course going to play in your business right now? Is it going to be an onboarding? Is it going to just be a lead magnet, right? So what role is this course going to play in your business? Another thing is your topic, right? So what is your topic? And in your topic, there are a couple of things that you have to think about. And number one is who are you actually speaking to? And it's really important to know that because you have to structure your content to speak to that, to that person, right? To that group of people. So for instance, let's say, that I have decided that I wanted to focus on moms of young children that are trying to date. Those are the people that I'm speaking to, right? So it's important for me to know that because the content that I'm creating is to get them from point A to point B. And if I don't know who I'm talking about, then I also can't identify what they're dealing with, right? So let's say I have decided to focus on moms of young children that are trying to date, okay? And so I've isolated the group that I'm trying to speak to. Then I need to think about, and this is you planning your course, once I do that, then what are some of the issues that those people are dealing with that I want to address? So some issues, right, that, that moms of young children who are trying to date might be facing, right, is one, they might be struggling to feel sexy as a woman because they're overwhelmed with mom duties. Um, they might be struggling with how to create boundaries between their dating life and being a mother. They might be struggling with knowing when and how to introduce the person they're dating to their children, excuse me, to their children or when to tell the person they're dating that they even have children, uh, knowing how to navigate the interactions between their children's father and the person they're dating. So for you as an exercise to begin to plan your content, the first thing is, okay, this is the work that I do. Who is the audience that I'm speaking to? And what situation are they in? My situation that I identified, was moms of young children that are trying to date, right? Let's say I'm a relationship coach or a relationship therapist or even a women empowerment therapist and I wanna you know, focus on one aspect of the woman's life. So I know what I do, I've isolated who it is that I'm, or should I say I've identified who it is that I'm trying to speak to. Then the next thing you wanna do is what are some of the issues that those people are having? Make a list of that. 
right? So that's a task for you. So make a list of some of the issues that they're going through, like I have in this section here. Either they struggle to feel sexy, knowing how and when to introduce the person they're dating to their children, et cetera, right? So you want to make a list of that. The second thing, or should I say the third thing that you have to think of is what is the objective of the course to this audience, right? In this situation with this issue, what is it that I'm trying to help them get to? So let's say for instance, this is my audience and maybe the issue that I want to work on is that they don't feel sexy as a woman, right? So where they're starting is, they're struggling to date and their dating life is suffering because they feel overwhelmed. They feel disconnected as a woman, right? That's where they're starting. Where I'm trying to get them to is having healthy boundaries in their life, being able to um, care for themselves so that they're able to, you know, feel like a woman again, feel sexy again, and have a prosperous dating life. That's my A and my B. So what is it? So your another task for you is again to identify where are the people starting and then where do you want to get them to by the end? Okay. So so far in your tasks, you have number one, you got to think about who you're speaking to, right? Number two, make a list of the different issues that that person in that situation or that group of people in that situation may be having. Number three, you wanna identify your starting point and your ending point, right? Where are they starting? She's struggling, she doesn't feel like a woman, she's overwhelmed. Where by the end of your course, when they have your information, when they've done the practice, when they've done that stuff, where will they end up? What's the objective to get them where? That's another thing that you need to list, okay? Um, something else that you need to think about is what is their experience level? Okay, because this is going to deal, or should I say, this is going to um, determine how you speak to them. So let's say I am making a course about gardening, right? I'm making a course about gardening and uh, I have to make a decision. Am I talking to novice gardeners who just want to know how not to kill their first orchid, <laughs> right? Am I talking to that person or am I talking to an experienced horticulturalist who has a PhD, you know, who's a, a master gardener and that kind of thing? Because the way that I would talk about gardening to those people, even if it was just about orchids, right? Let's just say it's all about growing and caring for orchids. The way that I would deliver that course, the language that I would use, the density of the material, right? How much I would pack material in there would be very different for a person that doesn't know anything versus a person who is an expert in this. So these are things that you have to know before you get to your content, yeah? Um, the next thing, that you want to think of is, okay, I've identified who I'm speaking to, right? I've listed out some issues. I've chosen the issue that I want. I've identified, okay, where are they starting? What do I want to get them to by the end of this course? I'm clear about who I'm speaking to. Let's say I'm going to speak to um, novice gardeners, right? how not to kill your first orchid and let it thrive for a long time. I'm terrible at titles, but go with me, <laughs> right? So that's, that's what I'm doing. Okay, so once I know that information, then what content needs to be included in that? What do novice people who know nothing about caring for a plant need to know? Are there skills? Are there things that they need to practice? Um, is there, you know, do they need to know about soil care? Do they need to know about orchid history to be able to make an orchid live? If they don't, 
then orchid history doesn't need to be in there. And that's one of the things that's really hard, um, especially when you're an expert in your field, is to not overwhelm people with knowledge that's not really necessary to the objectives. That's just interesting information to know. Um, so what are the things that they need to know? If I was thinking about my mother's, right? If I go back to my mom's example, um, then, uh, so I'm, I'm talking about mothers of young children who are looking to date, right? Because they feel unattractive. Well, what do they need to know? How can I encourage them? Are there beliefs are na or narratives that need to be dispelled? What strategies do they need to help them feel more empowered? What is it that I need to include in that course to help them get from feeling overwhelmed and unattractive as a woman to feeling empowered, having boundaries, knowing how to you know, do self-care so they can feel good and have a thriving dating life? Yes? Um, and then the next thing is, what order? do you want to deliver that in, right? So sequencing, like what do they need to know first? I can't teach this because I haven't taught them this yet, right? So those are things that you want to think about when you're creating the content of your course. Okay, I'm going to stop there because I saw some things pop up. <laughs> So it can seem overwhelming, but it's not. These are just decisions that you have to make. Um, I could show you, um, I, have a, I have a little, it's not little, but I have one of those, um, what do you call these things? Kind of like notebooks. And I just make mind maps. But these are the things that I've realized as an educator that we have to consider before we're able to deliver content, right? So I wanna pause there for a second. Um, are there questions or comments? I did have a question earlier um, about, that was still about the platforms you talked about. Mm -hmm. I'm sure when you started creating online courses, you got lost quite quickly and you probably tried different platforms. So I was just wondering, with the hindsight you have right now, mm -hmm. for a new coach who is just starting to think about creating online courses, um, what would you recommend to them to save all that time, the pain, the money that you might have wasted all those years ago? How, how to find the one that is right for you? I would start small. I honestly would. I would start much smaller than I did. Um, one of the things that I was struggling with as I was looking at um, very experienced people and where they were and thinking, oh, okay, that's what I have to do to look at. Listen, I paid $500 to do a three-month program with a guy who recorded his video from the side as he drove to pick his child up. The phone was mounted in his car. So it was, it was a side profile. This is how I saw him. And he's talking to us while driving to work. So I can see the neighborhood pass by as he's teaching. And the reality was I didn't care. All I wanted was the content. So one of the things that was very hard for me to, to overcome was thinking that it had to be so much more than it needed to be. For instance, um, you know, you have videos that are very well produced and, you know, they've got cuts and, you know, all kinds of B-roll and stuff like that. But then you also have very successful courses that are that are called Talking Head, which is just me just talking into the camera right here and all you see is my face. Um, you could do something as simple as um, a PowerPoint. So maybe, you know, you you want to show visuals, right? Um, you want to show visuals, but you're not ready for video yet, well, then you can just do a PowerPoint and talk over that. And the, and the beautiful thing about it is you are building something over the life of your work. So you can always add later. You can always restructure it later. You can always make it bigger and better. You're going to be building it over the life of your work anyway. So to answer your question, 
um, I would I would start small. You, you got to be really careful about <laughs> who you look at because you got to look at them and you got to go, okay, wait a minute, where am I? That's why I was talking about that, having a realistic conversation about where am I? Because what it takes to actually put a course together is not a lot. You need a way to talk, right? You need a way to structure it. You need a way to deliver it. If you don't know all of the technology yet, you can go on something as simple as Canva. You can use Loom or Zoom. You can record yourself and then you can post it on something like Udemy. Like if you just want to start there, you can start there. I think the bigger thing and why I did the bulk of it in the content is because sometimes we get we get so overwhelmed with what it looks like because we live in such a visual culture that we forget it doesn't matter what it looks like if your content is terrible, <laughs> right? If your objective is not clear, if you're not leading people through a clear journey um, and actually something that produces results, what it looks like, it can be the, the most amazingly produced course out there but if it's not getting people to what you said it would get them to, or if it's not clear what you're trying to get them to, the rest doesn't matter. So I would start simple. Yeah. Hi, Miss Doreen. Hi, Marlita. Hi, Rina Eldico. Um, the question I have is when you spend a ton of time doing a course that you don't even know anybody needs or wants, have you had that experience? Yes. <laughs> so I heard a woman and I thought this was wonderful. So one of the things, and this is about, you know, like how do you promote your course? And something that's really popular right now is speaking to exactly what you're asking, Ms. Doreen, is how do I validate the course so that I don't spend all of this time for nothing? And for a while, the popular stuff was, okay, um, don't really build it, just, you know, make a shell of it and then go sell it before you build it. And then if you sell it, then go build it real quick. And I was like, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> First of all, I need time. And the reality is it takes way longer to, well, okay. It takes longer to put a course together than you think. I personally, again, know yourself. So I personally didn't want the pressure of trying to throw a course together, knowing that people have paid for it and are waiting for me. I didn't want that. So another thing that I heard to do that, which I thought was great to validate the courses is teach a portion of it, right? So let's say I wanted to start it as just a workshop or a masterclass before I build it out, what what is a really quick win um one small thing that you can teach right and then you teach that as just you know hey i'm going to teach this come show up with me i'm going to do an hour workshop maybe it's a two-day workshop maybe you just teach it live maybe it's the whole thing and you say hey i'm going to do this for 10 weeks and you teach it live and see how that goes what's wonderful is that you can see is anybody going to pay for this um, you can try it on live people, which I promise as, as expert as we are in, in our information and what we know, there are things that we take for granted or that become second nature that we don't think of that bumping it up against a live audience will illuminate where we're like, oh, I should have, I should put that in there as well. So that's how I would say, Ms. Doreen, is, is teach it, teach it live first, either a small component of it. Or if you want to run the whole thing, try that first. Another way you can validate is by looking at um, other marketplaces. So for instance, if I go on to Udemy or Skillshare or one of these marketplaces, and let's say you, you do um, uh, a course on pet care, I would, I would look up pet care and see, are there are there other courses and how are they, are they selling? You know, if I see that, that there are several pet care courses and each of them have 50,000 students, okay, well, there's obviously a market out there for me. 
I didn't realize it, you know, or how to shuffle better. If I wanted something as, as seemingly small as that, how to shuffle cards better, I can look, is there a market for that? So those are, those are a couple of ways um, that I would do that. Thank you. Or, you know, you can do what I did, which is, you know, the crazy way is go on and build it, right? Um, and then take the time to, to make it work. You know, go find the people, go build the audience. That is also a way if you have the... If you have the would you say that um, it depends really on the type of thing you're teaching or you're training or because some things are very, you know, sequential specific, you have to follow, you know, and if you miss two or three steps, then don't take the course. Mm -hmm, you're mm -hmm, going to mm -hmm. get there. And then there's other things that are more personal growth, more, I think it, like if you're, I, I my, my understanding uh, and learning is if you're in like a legal field or, um, you know, in a field that's very specific, then you have to really build it <laughs> I think you have to build it where it's very specific I think if it's more experiential and you're mm -hmm. when you're actually training and teaching that your audience or your your participants your customers will actually evolve then I think it could be more loose more generic well yes yes it's kind of true but in terms of what I believe you're asking in connection to your earlier question, how would I validate it? Even if I was teaching something in a legal field, right? Something as structured as a legal field where it's sequential, you have to know this before you know this. If I wanted to validate it, I could just choose the foundational part of that. Because yeah. if you think of you know, sequential material, you could break it up as modules, right? So what's the foundational module? What's the first first thing that they need to know or the basics that they need to know and I can validate it through that and in that I can ask people is this something that you want to continue with what other things would you like to know there are ways that I could interact with my students that would help me build that course out further and validate whether this is something that they even wanted um, and I'll go back really quickly to just because we're talking about sequencing. So remember um, towards the beginning when I was talking about all of those issues that a mother with young children that's trying to date might be dealing with, right? Uh, she might be struggling to feel sexy. She might be struggling to know how to create boundaries between her dating life and being a mom, knowing when and how to introduce the person they're dating to their children when to tell the person they're dating that they have children, et cetera. So I might decide, oh, okay, these are the issues that I've listed. Are those part of one big course that I break up into modules or, or are those individual courses, right? And one of the ways that you make that determination is, um, is it necessary for them to know, let's say I have, you know, these, these ideas. If I break, if, if I drop somebody in here, do they need to know all of this in order to be successful here? If they don't, if, if they can just learn that, then I could possibly teach that as an isolated course. If they do need to know this before they can be successful here, then that needs to be a module within a bigger course. You know what I mean? But going back to your validating, this might be something that I go, oh, is this where I want to anchor my course? Is this, you know, something that I could just teach really quickly to validate? Is this even an idea that people are interested in? And the other question I have, your experience uh, in relation to just putting a course out there that a person takes from A to Z, so mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, evergreen type. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. or you are actually part of the training uh, live and mm -hmm. your experience on that so I've had both experiences um one is I have a 12-week cohort that I teach so I work with artists it's one of the groups that I work with and I have a 12-week curriculum that I take them through we meet 
every week for 12 weeks and I lead them through a set curriculum. That's wonderful. The, the wonderful thing about that is I get to be in those conversations with them and it's a rich experience that we have together. One of the drawbacks is for people who can't make that particular time, they don't get access to that material. So I had to make a decision. One, what's really important for me? Is it, is it important that they be with me? Is that the only way they can get the fullness of this course? If not, then I can open it up to a more self-directed format. Right. And I've decided, yeah, this can work as a self-directed format. So what I decided to do was create a workbook that people could go through that by themselves or in a community. So I was able to create options for that that way. Um, and then what I'm working with now for my Nell That Niche course, the way that I decided to do it, one of the things that was, let me, let me say this first. One of the things that was important for me in making that choice is one, I am still, <clears throat> I'm still settling myself here in California. Um, I'm, I'm a caregiver for my mom. Um, I travel, right? I'm an artist. So I needed a structure that did not tie me down all the time, right? So with this Nail That Niche course, <clears throat> what I decided was, I would structure it as a workbook. So people could go through it in a self-directed manner, but I'm going to um, create kind of a virtual office hours slash co-working space where people could go through it by themselves or in community. And then once a week, I'll be online for three hours to answer questions where people could say, hey, uh, I'm on step seven. Could you help me with that? And we can connect once a week or they can work with other people who are going through that. So it really depends, Ms. Doreen, on where you are because in your life and what's important and what your priority priorities are, because that's going to affect how you structure it. It's, it's hard when you think, oh, okay, I'm going to do this and we're going to, we're going to get together twice a week for six months, and then you realize, oh my God, my life is not conducive for that. And then it becomes difficult to fill that out or you've trapped yourself in, in one particular format without thinking, what can I actually sustain mm -hmm. over a long period of time? Marlene, I really like the sequencing that you provided in the sense that you know you did the 12 weeks, then you went into the workbook and self-directed with q and I think it's an awesome idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so there are lots of options. It, it just depends on what would give you what you need as the provider, because you're the one that's going to have to keep providing this. So you, if you have a lot of open space in your life and you can be there all the time, well, then you'll pick a structure, a, a delivery method, right, that will do that. If you need more room and more flexibility, you want to give the students more autonomy and yourself more autonomy well, then you would pick a, a structure or a delivery method to reflect that. And you can always shift. You can always shift. Any other questions of any of the material? How am I on time? I've been um, not paying attention. I'm good. How, how much time do I have left? 10 minutes, okay, perfect. Um, let's see. So we kind of talked about um, in Ms. Doreen's questions, what some of the things that we want to think about. So just in the 10 minutes in closing, um, again, I think it's really, really important to think about where you are because you can start right where you are. You can always expand. You can always change directions. You can always restructure how you did it. You can always take things away. Um, you can start much simpler than you think you can, right? Way simpler. You asked earlier the advice that I would give, start way, way simpler 
than you think, especially for your first course. And again, the biggest thing is to remember why you're even doing this is because you are trying to take a person, a student from point A to point B, how you get them there, what's the information or the experiences, the practices, the skills to get them from where they are to where you want them to be. That's the most important thing, right? And if getting them there can be achieved by me sitting in front of a computer and talking, then take the simple route, right? You can always build later. A couple of things that I would say in terms of just some other things to, to caution yourselves with is uh, Stu McLaren, when he talked about memberships, he said one of the biggest reasons that people drop out of memberships is because of overwhelm. <clears throat> and I know that I, my friend and I call each other this, but I am a hose. I can hose people down and overwhelm them with information, especially because I'm so excited and I want to give them everything. I'm like, I want you to be so, I'm going to give you everything. <laughs> and it's overwhelming um, for them. So when you're creating your course, what's the information they need to know in that course or in that module? If you look on the marketplaces like Udemy and Skillshare, something that you'll notice is they break their videos up. They'll have, you know, maybe sometimes seven, eight hours worth of content, lots of videos, 32 videos, 40 videos. Sometimes it's only five or 10, but each of those videos is only five to 10 minutes. So the way that people are consuming information now, you really want to cut it down because overwhelm is, is a big thing, right? So I'm always better as an editor. <laughs> so I just, put it all out and then go back and go, okay, what is actually really critical for them to know in this, in this format? Um, another thing is, this was big for me, was perfectionism. Um, I wanted things to be perfect before I ever got it out. And it took me forever to get it out because it was never perfect. And I was always like, oh, oh, I could do this better. I would learn something new. And then I was like, oh, God, I can't release the course because now I want to do this. And now I want to do this. Oh, shoot. I, I heard a pin drop in the back. Now I got to do the whole thing over. <laughs> Again, I paid $500 to take a course from a man who filmed from the side in his car as he was driving to pick his daughter up. And I did not care. Um, there's a guy... Um, Tim Grawl, this was very freeing for me. He teaches um, uh, about books. He, he coaches authors and things. And I was like, oh, I can't release my, my course because my website isn't done right, right? I have to have this amazing website. This man charges 20000 20, you know, $30,000 to work with clients. And his website had a blue background with some text. That's it. No fancy pictures, no fancy nothing. So perfectionism, people really don't care. They just want that amazing transformation that you're going to provide for them. Um, and then the last thing again is just really, really, really think about the overwhelm because that's a really big factor. I would, I would even go over the course and then give it to someone who doesn't know your material to see are there places where like this is just too much um, because you can always break that material down into smaller courses yeah okay i was going to mention that i i did that i, I was smiling earlier when you said that uh, you just want to give everything so yes. <laughs> I, I started creating some courses and it become a monster. Um, yes. I remember one of them was when the first lockdown happened, COVID, two years ago. And um, I did a beta group and I just wanted to give them everything. So yeah. we were meeting every two days and between them, I was creating new content for the next day and giving them loads of work to do and takeaways. So here you go, you've got all the time, you want to get clarity, you want to figure out what to do. And here you go. 
and yeah. they, they were really good because they were very keen and um, so they they went with it but then I started noticing that it became a, too much and I didn't have enough time to do it so and and, and also it's about um putting all the energy in but over time mm. then you run out of energy and then yes. you lose you lose it and then you can't do anything worse than that because right. then you start really great and then it just goes downhill. So what would you recommend for people like me who I sprint and then over time it kind of pushes away a little bit? Um, how to maintain the energy and how to how to figure out how to pace it was the best way to do that. Rather than, hey, you go, I want to give you everything and it's all exciting and 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 whatever. Um how 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 do you control yourself basically so are you only giving what they need right now for this week so it's enough to mm -hmm. get their head around to get some reflection going to get some clarity but not everything at the same time do, do you have any tips or recommendations for that i do i do so one one of the things i'll repeat that i what i just said is you know if you know that you're a hose person even if you don't know if you're a host person or not, where you can just give a lot of material. If you're, I'll say, I'll say this first, pacing is something that is practiced. You, you don't know until you do it. You don't know until you have students and you see them going, <laughs> but you go, oh, oh, am I, oh, is that too much? <laughs> right, so there is a give and take. There is this idea in teaching called reflexive teaching where I'm teaching and then I'm assessing, how did that go? How did my students receive that? So there is a bit of that um, give and take, that try something and then assess it, that's going to be necessary for you to develop, you know, really understand what's too much and what's not. So some, a lot of that is gonna come with time. But before that is, again, do a workshop with it. Right. If you want to do a test, do a workshop of a part of it, um, you know, grab some friends and say, you're my friend. Sit here. I'm going to teach this to you. Was that too much? You know what I mean? So you can get some feedback before you even go into there of how was that you could do, um, you know, a trial course. Hey, guys, I'm going to do this trial course. You know, I'm going to teach part of this material and I'd love for you to give me some information. Was that too much? Um, have somebody else look at it. And then I would say a big part of it is the awareness of you and I as the teacher, as the educator, as the giver of information to realize there are a lot of things that we can do quickly because we have steeped in this information for sometimes years before we ever deliver it, right? but they are only hearing it for the first time. So we can speed through the material. There are things that we, oh yeah, yeah, I make these jumps and this jump and I'm not even thinking about how I'm connecting things together because I've had the time to spend time in it. They're going to need to spend time in it as well. So a lot of us could write stuff and then take half of that out and it would still be just at the point, right? people are going to need more time than we think they're going to need. And that's something for us as the deliverers of this information to, to keep in our mind. There's a great point. Thank you. You're welcome. I am in your hands now. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> And I would say one more thing um, is having a clear objective will help you stay on task, right? So there's, you know, when you have a clear objective, you're able to filter better. Is this something that they need to know to get them to a, the objective? Is this necessary to help them get to the objective? Or is this something I just think it's going to be really cool for them to know? And, and that takes us you know, being able to be really serious editors of that. And again, if if you can't do it, get with your friend who's like, no, sis, you don't need that. Mm, I don't need that. Take that out. That's not necessary. And that will help you as well.
is being really clear about what am I actually trying to get them to do in this lesson, in this module, in this course, whatever it is, having clear objectives about why am I giving them this material? I know that, you know, consuming content, online courses and such is such a big deal these days. You know, people, you know, there is this whole um, world now of you don't need university degrees. You can learn it on, all online. I learn a lot through YouTube. That's my best friend. Yeah. I for a lot of things. Um, but I also do realize that um, the courses that I paid for in the last years, I never really finished them. Yes. I consumed and, and and why did you finish them? Well, it's too much. It's like spending half of your of your life just in front of it, watching and watching. It's just so much content, and um, you lose interest after a while, I would guess. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's really it's it's a lot. Yeah. And, but because we also have become such content creators, so I think after a while, any coach that has been around for a while, they have lots and lots of content and I want to share it all because it's rather than me explaining over and over again right uh, if I can refer somebody to one of my replays oh my god that's such a relief for me because I get bored in those topics too and so repeating yeah. myself it's like oh no I have this replay from last year do you want to watch it says you and me lots and lots of time we move on with the cool new things what do you think yeah. the future of the online industry learning industry is going to be like what trends think, do you see and what recommendations would you have for people? I mean, if we look at, I mean, there's always the possibility of the pendulum swinging back to, you know, what it was. But if we're looking at the trends now, even with, you know, the technology platforms going into micro content, you know, TikTok, three minutes, 30 seconds, Instagram, you know, all of these people are doing micro content just to say, Again, if you look at those marketplaces on Skillshare, Udemy, those kind of places, those videos are only five to 10 minutes at the most. And they may have several videos in there. So for you and I, I think a better way to do it, a very successful way to do it is, okay, in this course, what's the one thing, like, keep each course to one objective, right? And then you can create a suite of courses that take people along a trajectory. But with the small courses, right? These kind of mini courses, these small courses, these one objective courses, then people feel a sense of accomplishment. Rena, you were talking about you never finish because these things are so long. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, I've been doing this forever and there's 30 more modules. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if that content was, was smaller and it was one course, then there's a sense of, oh my God, I feel good. Okay, maybe in a month I'll do the next one because I know I can finish that in, in a couple of weeks or in a month or whatever. So I, I think that I think that right now, especially with the overwhelm of so much information, making those small courses, those quick win courses, and if you have something um, that you know that that's more sequential and more in depth, then then you create that structure and lead people through a sequence, but with these small wins along the way. unless you have, but you'll always have, you'll always have that small group of people who have, who have the stamina to do deep work, but understand your deep work people are always a much smaller audience. Which kind of like takes me to what you take, what is your take on pricing of the courses? I realized that the reason maybe why I didn't finish them is because I want to get that one portion of it but i have to pay two thousand dollars and get the whole elephant but i actually just need one thing from it and that's what i consume and the rest is kind of like a throw-in but rather yeah. than telling me for three hundred dollars what i need they're selling me two thousand dollars with all this other content that i don't actually need because yeah. i've not grown it and so on so what is your take on pricing bundling it and so on I, and also i think one of the one of the biggest barriers that you'll you and I will have to deal with is 
is just that, Rena. It's pricing, right? Whether someone really wants your content and they can't afford it, or or they have, you know, mental blocks about paying that much for it. What's what's the what's the what's the way to eliminate as many barriers to getting your information as possible? If you don't need to make a two thousand dollar course to get them from A to B, then don't. You, you can make the $2,000 in other ways. And I think more people will come if you just give them what they need, right? I, I would rather pay, I'd rather pay $79, $89 for a small course that gets me to a quick win than $2,000 that I have to, I'm like, oh my God, I don't, I didn't need half of this stuff. Um, so I think, I think that is totally a decision for you and I that that's you know very personal to you. I like giving people options, right? So like my workbook. You want to buy the workbook? You're just starting, you don't have a lot of money. 42 bucks. There you go. 42 bucks. Go with it. It's clear enough for you to do it yourself. But hey, you want to work with me one on one? Okay. I charge 350 a session. You want to do a group? I can write so I can create tiers of how I deliver that um of how i deliver that they give options and and especially for me um pricing was a big confidence thing i was like oh god i can't charge like i feel stupid <laughs> saying pay me 2000 you know what i mean like sometimes when we're starting out there are these these mental roadblocks that we have to even fix our mouth to say some of those prices um and so there are ways to to tear that that feel good and feel authentic and feel integral to us as as content providers well thank you so much uh marlita i don't see any other questions okay. um so do let us know how can people connect with you if they have yeah. any questions um, so you can find me on social media um, at the niche nailer. I'm on Instagram, TikTok. Um, you can also go to my website um, at nailthatniche.com. And my, you know, I'm just have... dropping it under the video. So those of you who are watching oh, this replay on YouTube, you're gonna get all the handles you can find all the handles under the video and those of you who are watching us now live on facebook also grab um her details under the video i've just posted it any last parting words um please reach out if you have questions i'd love to help you out um and thank you again for having me and keep it simple keep it simple keep it simple <laughs> that's one thing i had to learn the hard way but yeah i totally agree so I hope you found this conversation interesting. I hope you learned something new. As you can see, we again got some golden nuggets, some lots and lots of ideas on how to do differently. So all the best to you, Marlita, in your journey. Thank you. Everyone who was here with us on Zoom. And perhaps I mentioned here, people ask, are asking us all the time for the Zoom link because they can't find it and we're going live and sometimes we can't see it on Facebook. So when you look at the flyer of the event, there is the Zoom number on it. So you can find it, it's updated every time I put the new Zoom number there. So if you're someone who kind of like gets lost and can't find your way here to the Zoom, also head over to our Facebook group. We are going live right now as we are live in the Facebook group. You can also join us there and we are keeping our, our, our eyes on it in case there are any questions. So there are many ways of engaging with us. And thank you so much for everyone to everyone for being here with us. Marlita, I enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for all your wisdom. Oh, all the best to you on your journey. Yes. Thank and, you. Uh, as well. Yeah, Luke is also there. <laughs> and so we uh, will be seeing you later all today. If you would like to join us, there's going to be another podcast um, in, in a few hours. So join us. I'll, I'll put all the links uh, in the chat. Three hours. <laughs> Three hours. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Malita. Bye, Thank everyone. You.